welcome, welcome, all of you. Thank you so much for coming to this event tonight. We have all been anticipating this um, and with uh, much excitement about a discussion this evening. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time telling you who Meg Mott is because you're all here because you know who Meg Mott is. Um, so I want to thank you so much for coming back to do this next installment of the Second and Third Amendments. I want to thank the friends of the Brooks Memorial Library because they are the people that fund this program and all the wonderful programs that we have. And I also want to let you know that um, last month, Meg was showing her copy of the Constitution. And so thanks to Trustee Howard Burroughs, we all have, we have um, lots of copies of the Constitution. So you can all pick yours up to take home with you. Yay. We have one with superheroes and one with a na nature scene on the front. So we'll just see who chooses what. They, are, they will be available at the circulation desk after the program. So I welcome you and welcome to Meg Mott. Hey. Thank you, Scar. And thanks everybody for coming out. Um, so you maybe know this joke. I knew it when I was a kid. What's black and white and red all under? under? It's a twist on an old joke. So the, the, the answer is your presenter. But, but they're, they're, okay, so black and white and red all over. What's the answer to that joke? The newspaper. The newspaper. Uh, almost. What else is black and white and I hope is red all under? Yes, Billy Strauss in the back. What is that? It's got to be the Constitution. Um, and, and this is one of the fabulous games we get to play in the United States of America. Because we live in a constitutional democracy, which means that the Constitution rules, and it's a democracy, which means the majority gets to determine what the Constitution means, which sometimes means the population at large, and sometimes, oops, my sound is going, which is appropriate for what I'm about to say. And sometimes that majority is an esteemed group on a high bench who are wearing black robes. So that's how that game goes, constitutional democracy. You have the Constitution, that's the rules, and you have democracy, which means the majority wins. But here's a very fun thing about constitutions and poetry. The interpretation is often in the eyes of the reader, of the beholder. And what we're going to talk about tonight is a heavily interpreted uh, amendment, the second. Um, not quite so much the third, but the two are tied together. And uh, when we did this last two years ago in Putney, and we had a lot of people who were part of gun owners of Vermont who understood how the Second Amendment fits into all, um, all 10 amendments. And they also made a strong point, which I think is right, that the Second Amendment is often should be tied to the third. So I took the cue from them two years ago to do that. And it turns out not only the gun owners of Vermont see the Second and Third Amendments as deeply twined, so does a certain composer from Connecticut. So um, as we were graced last month with the festival, I'm sorry, the festival harmony. Well, we changed our name. Oh, what is your name now? Well, our, name. our name now is that's proposed. And those of you who heard festival harmony last week, you may be interested to know that tonight you're going to hear the Constitution Choir. Ooh, <laughs> the Constitution Choir. Yes. Now, how many of you prefer the name Festival Harmony? Let's see your your hands. <laughs> how many of you prefer the name Constitution Choir? Okay. I think you. I think you have excellent. All right. So without any. It's actually, Meg's idea. So, Meg first used the phrase Constitution. So here we are. Without any further ado, let us begin our discussion tonight with the Constitutional Choir. Constitution. Not all, but Constitution. Constitution Choir. Got it. Yes. And we're going to start with the Second Amendment, and then we'll see where that goes next. Singers. Ah, ah. Ah. 
to us, first of all, what is that music? Because you've put this together. This, these were written, well, actually, they were, uh, the amendments come out four years after the Constitution, but there, people are thinking about these things prior to even the Constitution. Right. So can you explain to us like, what this music is that you showed up? Yeah. In the late 18th century, we have our first really uh, American composers. And, uh, the most important one from a historical point of view, but also I would argue from the point of view of the intrinsic value of the music is William Billings. He was a composer in Boston. He taught singing. He did uh, six extremely important uh, collections of his own music. He died in 1800. He was very active as a patriot in the revolution. He was a personal friend of Samuel Adams and a lot of the other uh, people in, active in politics in revolutionary circles in Boston. So Billings is a natural choice. That piece is in the style of William Billings. Why did I put the Second and Third Amendments together? Well, we're going to be talking about that later. But from my point of view, it was a purely musical decision <laughs> because they're short. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I didn't want to have like 10 amendments, 10 bill, and amendments to the Bill of Rights, movement one, movement two, da da da, movement 10. No, I wanted a little bit of breaking it up. And later on, I had, I had to think, what other two amendments could go together like that? Um, well, it turns out that the two I put together later on are the seventh and the eighth, hmm. which do not have much in common as far as the text is concerned. One of them has to do with the right of, of trial by jury in civil trials, and one of them has to do with cruel and unusual punishment. Both of those things are another discussion for another time. But these two amendments are very much about the same thing, which is, among, well, they're about lots of things, but they're also both about the military. So obviously it said, this is March music. Mm -hmm. So you just heard a march in the style of William Billings. Great. That? That's perfect. Thank you very much. So what Neely just showed us is that this game that we play in the United States of America, not only is it a game in which we have these rules that come out of the Constitution, but the rules were developed by people in the 18th century. So it's an old game. 
and part of my effort tonight is for us to go back and think about uh, how the founders thought about these words and what possible interpretations they gave. And they weren't monolithic. They had their own disagreements, and then to watch how, over time, interpretations change. Which means we are going to get more confused when we play the game together. That's just how it's going to be. When you're playing a game and people start interpreting the rules differently, it's harder to feel like you're actually playing the same game. And my job tonight is not to have everybody come away with one interpretation, but to understand how the interpretations track over time and what people were thinking when they came up with these specific words. So that's what I'm hoping for, and I'm uh, welcoming strong opinions on both sides of this very divided issue. Um, I am hoping that people are able to speak in such a way that they become more persuasive and not uh, just shout down one another. Sometimes that will happen when we're talking about the Second Amendment. Uh, my job is to help people become more persuasive in their feelings and, um, and be able to hear one another. Because that's really the job in front of us, is for us to be able to hear one another about this um, pretty exciting set of amendments. So uh, we just, I've still got the third up there, um, which doesn't get enough attention unless you're paying attention to the Second Amendment, and then oftentimes you do spend time thinking about the third. Because this was a problem, people, especially in Boston, right? Uh, King George did not respect certain rights. King George, who came before, uh, who was part of the, the tyrant, they'd call him sometimes, in the colonies. So um, here's some language you might recognize. He has kept among us, in times of peace, standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. A horrible thing. Can you imagine having soldiers knock on your door? Well, maybe they wouldn't even knock on the door. Maybe they just push the door in, and then they'd be sleeping on your day bed. Or maybe they didn't like your day bed. Maybe they were upstairs in your own bed. Um, and that was something that was going on uh, in the colonies for quartering large bodies of armed troops among us. Nobody likes that. Nobody likes to have their town occupied by troops. They didn't have tanks back then, but there would be that same kind of force, that presence. And this then, does anybody recognize where these come from? Yes, do you want to tell us? Declaration of Independence. Can you tell us your name too? Martha, ooh, what a good name for speaking about just this sort of issue. Right, it comes from the Declaration of Independence, which ends with this line. Somebody want to read it? Somebody who wants to, maybe, as, does a singer, you've warmed up your voice. Some Singer, can we give you a, yes, your smiling mustache. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act, which may define a tyrant, is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Mm, excellent. We may have you saying a few more things. <laughs> um, so it turns out, if you don't follow certain rights, a free people has the authority to get rid of you because you are a tyrant. So this is the beginning of what we call the people's right to armed rebellion. And this is what the uh, Jefferson and others used to make a legal claim, right? They're playing a law game. This is not just, I don't like King George, I'm going to get rid of King George. It's more like, because you did this, this, and this, it's an indictment. Because you did all these things, you are no longer worthy of being the ruler of a free people. Oh, sure, you can be ruler of a bunch of subjects. Sure, you can be a bunch, a ruler of a bunch of slaves. But we are a free people, so you have lost your authority. Um, and you can see the Third Amendment is clearly making sure we don't go down that road again. And pay attention to some of these words like standing armies. That is what the new uh, political theorists of this time are uh, thinking about. I'm oh, sorry, I just got uh, distracted. I just saw some students I hadn't seen in a little while. Hi. Um, but this idea of a standing army, that's what they are very, very nervous about. We don't want to go down that road again. We don't want to have standing armies. 
So, um, as I mentioned, the Bill of Rights was not part of the original rule book. The Constitution comes out, and people think, well, it's pretty good, but it's not quite perfect, and we need to have the Bill of Rights. It takes them four years to get that. But there are elements in the Constitution where we begin to see why there's a problem with a certain form of government, and that the people who are creating this new game, they've got a very specific form of government in mind. This is Article 4, Section 4, if you have a constitution, you can look it up. It's always fun to like, oh, it's the same, same words all over the place. In every state, blue state, red state. You look at Article 4, Section 4, you're going to find this. The United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a republican form of government. They don't say constitutional democracy. They say a republican form of government. Anybody have a sense like, what does that mean? Yeah, what is a Republican form of government? Uh, in the back, yes. And, and can you tell us your first name? Yeah. Kevin. So Kevin. That is a direct democracy where everything is a referendum and everyone votes. Right. So Kevin is getting at this point that a direct democracy where everybody does everything, uh, a republic, he says, has a more representative form of government where you elect somebody and they represent you. Somebody else had their hand up or shouted something out. What's a part of a republican form of government? I'm searching for the right answers. I'm taking Kevin's, it's okay. It's not the gist of it, but it's, it's okay, Kevin. I, I'm okay with what you said. So let's find out. What is anybody else before I like humiliate you with, um, come on, people. This, yes, yes. I, I don't have any idea, but I'm wondering if it has something to do with having a, a legislature and an executive. So Alan hazards, because he's looked at the Constitution maybe, that maybe having a legislature versus an executive, and then we could also find a judiciary in there, that that may have something to do with a Republican form of government. Mm. It's okay. It's not essential. It's not essential. No kings. No kings, absolutely, is going to be part of it. We're not going to have kings, that's true. Marceline. Does it have to do with who is allowed to be a representative? It has, Marceline is saying, does it have to do with who is allowed to be represented? Like only, what are you thinking, Marceline? Um, only citizens with certain kinds of qualities, like perhaps their land owning and male and... So Marceline wants to put a little cynical twist on this whole idea of a Republican form of government, which it may mean that only certain uh, types of people are allowed to govern, such, and Marceline's saying landed, white males, that sort of thing. Is, but is that essential to a Republican? Remember, form people. Form, that's like, this is a form. We're an audience, it doesn't matter who's in it. Uh, a hand in the back and I'm going to Jinsey. Does it have to do with voting? Voting? Voting is definitely gonna be part of it. So uh, in fact, I'm gonna put the class close to what a key term is, consent of the governed. A Republican form of government has to have consent of the governed. If you don't have consent of the governed, then you're back to that whole thing of, oh yeah, my subjects, my subjects really like this new policy just enacted, as opposed to uh, some way that the governed get to show their consent. Yeah, at Jim C. Yes, I was just probably saying the same thing, but the, the, the government has to be elected by the people. So the government has to be elected by the people, so and then vote, we they have to vote. We have voting so that they choose, they they choose their representatives. Their right, and that's and this is how we demonstrate we have consent of the governed, and which is why voting is so important. And there's other ways that we can show consent of the governed, such as we don't engage in armed rebellion. But there's other components to a republican form of government, and that is rule of law. Ah, now we're back into this game. And if there's no rule of law, then that means it's rule of whoever's in charge. So this has got to be the, the rule book that everybody's looking at. And there's got another element to a Republican form of government, and that it protects the rights of the people. 
So it's a form of government. Yes, voting is going to be very important. And sometimes, as Alan mentioned, we need to separate out power. Uh, its purpose, though, is to protect the rights of the people. Oh, and I forgot to tell you who sponsors this game. Yes, this game is brought to you by We the People. I don't know where that company is located. I don't know if it's incorporated in the state of Delaware, but this idea of here we have this thing, we the people, that brings the whole thing, and that's what shows very much in the United States, key interest is a, Republi um, is a Republican form of government. It's there in our Constitution. So um, I'm going to now go take a step back and, and do a little bit of old political theory, we'll go back to one of my favorites, Machiavelli. Because a lot of these people were reading Machiavelli to try and understand what's it going to look like to have a Republican form of government. And here's one of his great lines. Is there somebody who wishes to uh, broadcast Machiavelli's... This is one of my favorite quotes, so... Anybody? Yes? Uh, yes, okay. Do you have a good voice or do you want a mic? I've got a mic. you got a mic. Okay, I'm going to give it to you bit by bit. Here we go. And what's your name? Orion. Oh, yes, you were here last time. Orion. Yeah. Beautiful name. By arming your subjects, you arm yourself. Those who were suspect become loyal. And those who were loyal are changed from being your subjects to being your partisans. Wow. Thank you, Orion. That's how it works. As by arming your subjects, you are able to verify you have their consent. Because if you did not have armed subjects, you could do whatever you like. Uh, the, the rest of that quote goes, as soon as you disarm your subjects, you start to offend them, showing whether through cowardice or suspicion that you mistrust them. And on either score, hatred is aroused against you. This is what Machiavelli writes to the prince. He's a very strategic thinker. He knows how to get inside the anxiety level of a ruler. And if you're a ruler, you're going to be thinking twice about disarming your subjects. Because then they are going to either think you're afraid of them, in which case they will think you're puny and not to be bothered with, or they'll think you don't trust them, and then they will hate you. Uh, here's Adam Smith. Um, and Adam Smith is another person. And let's start to notice the language they're using. What's the difference between a militia, which I think came up in one of those amendments, which one was it? The second, as opposed to standing army. And this is how Adam Smith makes this distinction. Is there somebody else who, who wishes to be Adam Smith? Jinsey wants to be Adam Smith. Great. Awesome. Here you go, here's your line. In a militia, the character of the laborer, art, art, that's a word, artif artificer, or tradesman predominates over that of the soldier. In a militia, the character of the laborer, the artificer, or tradesman predominates over that of the soldier. Thank you. Yeah. In a standing army, army, that of the soldier predominates over every other character. Yeah, so now here we get, thank you, Jensi. Now we get a sense of these two different things. Now remember, we may have a picture in our head of what a soldier looks like. We may have a 21st century picture in our head of what a soldier looks like. It may look like somebody who's been disciplined, who uh, since they stopped having a draft, now look comes from a certain segment of the population. It's usually somebody who's trying to advance themselves. Sometimes it's somebody with a lot of student debt. We may have a picture in our head of what the soldier looks like. Back then, they had another picture in their head. This were the, Marx would have called them the lumpen proletariat, the, uh, the underclass, the vagrants, the criminals. The kings would use people who were dangerous bodies and they would put them in their army and these are the people who would be marching around and building, uh, breaking down your door. So if you like, if you have a thug and a gang, Okay, I'm sure there's lovely reasons to sometimes operate on that level. I, I don't want to be too uh, judgmental, but a standing army is not somebody you want to be meeting down some dark alley. 
A militia, however, are your neighbors. A standing army, who knows? They're hired guns. So, in the United States, what they wanted were militias and not standing armies. They did not want to go down that road of tyranny. And James Madison, one of my favorites from the uh, uh, constitutional era, he wrote uh, Federalist 46, and he made this big claim, and this is going to be another important piece, as we're trying to understand, what did that Second Amendment mean when the people of a free state European governments are afraid to trust the people with arms. If the citizens were armed, it may be affirmed with the greatest assurance that the throne of every tyranny in Europe would be speedily overturned. So like Machiavelli, you want to make sure the population is armed. Other, that's what keeps the tyrant away. And here's the other piece. Um, I hope I, I may have said this later. Oh, yeah. Um, He's trying to develop an understanding at this time that the states are the site of power. And yes, we may have a constitution, and yes, we may be creating the central government. However, don't worry, people. Just because we're creating the central government, it doesn't mean that the states aren't still where all the action is happening. This is a picture to describe this federalism, this picture that, yeah, we may start that national government, but it's not going to be any bigger than the states. And the states combined, actually people will be far more attached to the states than they will be to the national government. So you don't have to worry about this whole constitution we've come up with, people, because the states are where people are at. Um, so it's a fairly complicated picture, though. We have the Second Amendment. We have the Third Amendment. We know that standing armies are scary. We know that the militias can be a good thing. And um, we have a system that tries to separate power on these two different levels. It is a very complicated game. I'm throwing a lot of constitutional language to you, and then we're going to start to get very specific to Supreme Court cases. Um, but I've just got a few more to kind of set the whole uh, complications of this constitutional game. So this is from the Constitution. Who's in charge of armies and militias? How do they slice it so that the states are central and the national government operates like this? No, we can't make a standing army. No, no, we can't. It's in our game book. So Congress can do this. It's kind of big. Somebody want to read this? Congress? Uh, Ryan, just because you've got a mic, would you be willing? Yeah. Uh, Congress can provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia. Yeah, and one more. And for governing such part as shall be employed in the service of the United States. Right. So Congress, uh, you know, they call them a National Guard which means that sometimes the national government is going to send people, this was famously happened in Little Rock, Arkansas, where the national government says to the states, you've got to make this happen. This is federal business. We're going to make sure these black school kids can get to school. So that seems to give a fair amount for, to Congress. But then there's more language, and that goes to the states. Ryan, do you want to read that one? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I apologize. I didn't have it on before. Yeah. The states uh, appoint officers. They have the authority of training according to the discipline prescribed by Congress. Right. Um, and I think that's all from Article 1, Section 3. So you notice some interesting parallels? Like what does the federal government do? And then what can the states do? What's, what's the big power that the states have for militias? Who's in charge? Who's in charge? They get to a point. Are you John? Matt. Matt, sorry. You work at the library. I forgot your name, sorry. Matt. Yeah, and, and what do the states, the states get to appoint people. They get to say who's in charge. But what does Congress get to do? They make the rules. They make the rules? Like that disciplining. That's kind of a big deal. Um, 
You could tell that after the Constitution is written and people start looking at it, there are concerns. Wait a minute. Did we just give Congress the authority to create a standing army? It's kind, it's, this is very, very dicey. Uh, yes, there are some constraints on congressional power, and this is also uh, from the Constitution Article 1. Congress can raise and support an army, but no appropriation of money to that use shall be for a longer term than two years. Wow, did you know that? You can, Congress can only appropriate money for no longer than two years. Suggests there need to be annual appropriations to the Department of Defense. Which is pretty big in terms of, I don't know, the budget is quite significant part. Um, but that is an effort to try and constrain Congress. Yes, Matt. The term of the House of Representatives, of course. And what? The term of representatives in the House of Representatives. And, and that the House Everybody of Representatives. turns over every two years. So you can't apportion, you can't appropriate money for longer than the term where we get to reelect every member of the House of Representatives. Do people hear that, Matt, that this two years has a lot to do with who is the appropriating body, the House of Representatives, they have a two-year term, they cannot appropriate money longer than their term. Um, as an idea of this should, as part of the design, constrain what Congress can do. Um, and Madison says, don't you worry, states, this is all going to be fine. We put constraints on Congress, we're not going to get a standing army. And this, again, comes from Federalist 46. Besides the advantage of being armed, the existence of subordinate governments to which the people are attached and by which the militia officers are appointed, as we already saw, <coughs> forms a barrier against the feds. So we shouldn't worry. We got everything down. It's all in the Constitution. You don't have to worry, states. Because um, this existence of subordinate governments, what's he talking about? The states, exactly. So we've got this very complicated system. Everything should be fine. And Second and Third Amendment come in to make sure that Federalist picture actually holds these two parties, states and the federal government, these two entities on the balance, on that balancing beam. So, everything looks pretty good. We've got our Second and Third Amendment. We shouldn't be having a standing army. We should have a Republican form of government. And now we're going to actually test out some of these uh, incidents, incidents through the courts. Everything is fine, so to speak, until 1872. This is one of the first Supreme Court cases that deals with the Second Amendment. Uh, and it came up af after the Colfax Massacre, Louisiana, 1872. Anybody heard of this Colfax Massacre? I mean, um, it was after Reconstruction in which uh, freed black men were trying to vote. Because remember Reconstruction, we get some new amendments. People should be able to vote. They go to the municipal building in order to register, and um, they are peacefully assembling in order to uh, get their vote. They also are carrying some weapons. And uh, white assailants come in, and 105 black people are killed, and three white people are killed. So this goes to the Supreme Court, because um, of the people who were killed, I'm sorry, of the people who were protesting, they said, this is a violation. You can't have the state attacking us. This is a violation not only of our First Amendment rights, we should have a right to assemble. That's part of our game book, uh, First Amendment. It also, it was a violation of the Second Amendment because we couldn't protect ourselves against these white assailants. And we should have, be able to have guns, said the black free men after Reconstruction. So it goes to the Supreme Court Cruikshank is one of the white assailants, and um, the Supreme Court says the Second Amendment has no other effect than to restrict the powers of the national government. And that's generally how the Bill of Rights has been understood. It constrains Congress. It doesn't constrain anybody else. 
Congress shall make no law, it says in the First Amendment. The Second Amendment constrains Congress from passing any laws that restrict the rights of people to bear arms. So the Supreme Court says, yeah, things may be bad in Louisiana, but we are not going after these white assailants because there is no Second Amendment right that actually pertains. And uh, the, the people uh, also, the United States took the case for the black free men who were trying to vote and they used a 14th Amendment argument and they said, the Supreme Court said, the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause does not grant a right to one citizen against another, only against state actors. So the 14th Amendment was an effort to try and constrain the states to make these rights pertain to the individual states and the Supreme Court says, nope, uh, you, don't, you don't have a case using your Second Amendment. And the convictions of the white men were overturned. At this point, people begin to say, what is the Second Amendment? It's really not good for much. So nobody is making a case, we have a right to bear arms, because the Supreme Court has said it's a very narrow, narrow ruling, and only, uh, it only applies to the federal government. So we go a long time, very long time, until we get another case, 1939. And this is a case where um, a guy has a sawed-off shotgun. He carries it across state lines. At the time, there was something called the National Firearms Act. He gets arrested under the National Firearms Act and, um, this, and wants to go to the Supreme Court, saying his Second Amendment rights are violated. And the justice says, somebody want to read this? Maybe we'll get the a mic around. Somebody want to read? Oh, we got Great. There is no evidence that a sawed-off shotgun has some reasonable relationship to the preservation or efficacy of a well-regulated militia. So looking at the well-regulated militia language in the Second Amendment, and, and Lynn, if you could just hold, give it to Lynn for, sorry, just for, there'll be another one, um, sorry, uh, that just because somebody has a sawed-off shotgun, the militia language precludes them from using a Second Amendment defense. However, he does say something else. This is Justice McReynolds. The militia comprises all males physically capable of acting in concert for the common defense. Wow, all of a sudden, it turns out you don't actually have to have joined a militia. You just have to be a male physically capable of acting in concert for the common defense. So whenever the justices speak, all of a sudden it's like, ooh, I hadn't read it that way before. A well-regulated militia. Is that an actual militia or is it a potential militia? Because this is a potential militia, I'm capable. I should have a Second Amendment and be able to use that defense against state interference. Uh, so that starts to raise this question, which begins to catch on. Yeah, Daniel. How did you get away with pulling this males, uh, this definition out of a hat? Is there any justification for it anywhere in the Constitution? Um, so, so Daniel's question about, um, you could say, if you go look at the history of the United States, a militia compromised all males physically capable of acting in concert for the common defense. That's the broadest definition, because it's a citizen militia. Is that, is that actually in the Constitution? Not in the Constitution, but remember, the Constitution, this is what's so much fun, right? When we play this game, they use ordinary language, and then we can go and see how do people understand what a militia was, and we understand that a militia is not a standing army, it's not somebody who was picked by a king, it's a group of citizens, and as Jinsey read, could be an artisan, a laborer, an artificer, a tradesperson. They just have to be capable of handling their weapons. It still seems like it's pulled out of somewhere even other than a hat. Ah, <laughs> ah but all it took was a majority of the justices, and you get, you get that authority. So um, here's a militia then starts to mean all sorts of different things. 
a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state could look like this, right? That's the National Guard. It's very well regulated. But with the Miller decision, it could mean something else. Jinsey. I was going to say, isn't a very important word in there, in concert? For them in, acting in concert. Right. Jinsey wants us to understand, yes, it, it's not a free-for-all acting in concert for the common defense. That's part of this legal definition. Yeah, Daniel. And here. And now, you're on your knees now. Does that mean you've like submitted to the justices? <laughs> does free state mean a state of the union, or does free state mean the federal government? Ah, what do people think? What's a free state? Is it the federal government, or is it a state in the union? Well, Neely. This time, wouldn't a free state mean the states? Means the states. State. Exactly. That would be unambiguous. Exactly. Exactly. It's not the federal government. A free state are the states, because that's where you have free citizens. So does it does a militia look like this? Or does a militia look like this? Because these are people who are capable of defending for the common defense. And that's a militia, how we would use it now, and that is, you know, you could also say that is a, uh, a 18th, 19th, 20th, well, I think this may be 20th century uh, militia. Uh, here's another picture. This is a militia. Yes, hand in the back. Couldn't it also be argued that a well-regulated militia is one that is answerable to the civil authority which it protects? Yeah, so did people hear Kevin, is that... Kevin's question, that you're saying that, couldn't you say that a well-regulated militia means that it's answerable to civil authority, as opposed to, well, okay, so they're not really answerable to the civil authority. I can't make that case. What? Who is civil authority? So, they answer to a certain civil authority. So, so Marcelin wants to make the point, and I think the Panthers at that time, they understood themselves as acting under the Second Amendment. Right. That they were doing what was necessary because they were living under tyrannical conditions, such as the LAPD or um, other uh, police state. Calif the whole state of California was not ha handling the Panthers very well. Jim. Yeah, just a quick question. What about uh, Shay's Rebellion? Shay's Rebellion, um, do you want to go into a little bit more of the details? Do you mind, Jim? Well, the, uh, I mean, I don't mm, uh, know a whole lot about it, but um, a group of farmers in Western Mass. Um, and the reasons why they felt uh, aggrieved, I, yeah. I don't really remember, but they, they organized themselves. Suffering foreclosures. Yeah. Because they were being forced to pay taxes on the Revolutionary War and they really didn't have the means. And they so marched they on Springfield or something. So, and so, do you want to say what they did? Can, Orion, can you, thank you. The last battle was in Sheffield, Massachusetts, and it wouldn't have taken place if there hadn't been a blizzard because they were ready to march on Springfield and they mm -hmm. would have marched on Boston. Yeah. The interesting thing is in terms of militia, to put down Shea's rebellion, they had to bring in troops from Germany. Oh. And they were the ones, because the Americans refused to fight other Americans. Wow. But the key, the key complaint was that they had fought the Revolutionary War and ended up in jail right. because they went into debt. Mm -hmm. And because they were debtors and didn't pay their debts, you went to prison. And then you lost the right to vote, mm -hmm. which was another part of being imprisoned. Mm -hmm. And so they were objecting to a number of issues uh, related to the way the state of Massachusetts was dealing with them. Right, and can you remind me your name? Sheldon. Sheldon, right. Uh, thank you, Sheldon. Because Sheldon's history, this is all happening prior to the Constitution. And the people who are writing the Constitution are very nervous. It's after. Shays Rebellion is after the Constitution? Yeah. Oh, thank you very much for that correction. Because um, I understood that people who were working on this, remember that book by Joseph Ellis and, and uh, the founders and us? There was this understanding that nobody wanted another Shays Rebellion. 
So there was, it was definitely the idea that people are going to be very angry and we had better give them some sense of say in this so that we're actually a republic and not a, um, a, ty a tyranny. Yeah, I yeah. think the last battle was 1789. 1789, okay, so that was uh, after the Constitution. But there had been some movement prior to the Constitution that got people pretty nervous. There's a hand right there in the back. It was 1791. Seventeen eighty seven the Constitution is signed and then seventeen ninety one we actually get our Bill of Rights. Well whenever that came to pass, that was when that was what they were afraid of. Right, exactly. What you said in the first place. Yeah, right. Thank you so much for saving me that. What can you remind us your name? Kim. Kim Ken? Yeah. Kim. Um, yeah, so there, so there is, the Shays Rebellion is haunting so much of this because Shays Rebellion shows what an armed rebellion actually looks like. Remember, the United States, the Declaration of Independence says, because the king is not playing well for a free people, we have the right to overthrow him. And if Shays Rebellion suggests that the people there in charge are not doing it well, that's going to happen again. So this is one of those things where an armed population, uh, and uh, you know, I'll go with Marcelin on this. The militias uh, are part of our history. It's a dangerous part. Armed rebellion is kind of part of our mix. That's how we are able to show we have consent of the governed. There may be other ways to do that, but this is a really strong part of our history. Alan. Sounds like Shay's Rebellion was as successful as it was, partially because there was no standing army to, to uh, fight them. And therefore, we had to bring, bring the Germans in. Yeah. Um, what we haven't discussed here, and, and I have no idea, is when we started to have standing armies in this country. Mm. Alan, and Alan raises a question, when do we start to have standing armies? I don't know the answer to that. Um, and, it's, and it is your point, though, that we didn't have one early on, and that's why people had to come up with something like get, bringing in the Germans, because we were very nervous about standing armies. So something did start to shift, because we clearly have standing armies now. So I want to stay with this whole thing around gun laws. Yes, Neely, and then I'll keep moving. About yeah. Standing armies. yeah. I'm not a historian, but somebody correct me. Uh, I'm not a historian. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. But I believe that we mobilized for World War II in like six weeks or something mm. like that which means that there was, there may have been some sort of an army, but what we think of as the modern standing army did yes. not exist as late as the 1940s. Right. And, and I'm, I stand, I would love to be corrected, but mm -hmm. that's my understanding. Yeah, interesting, yes. Yeah, it took a while to mobilize. Yeah, just Robert. About, yeah, just about that point there, just to ask a question, what about the First World War and the draft? Same thing happened, we mobilized. So okay, it takes. So they're, so, they're, so they're synonymous. So standing army means you are ready and ready to go. Yes. They, they demobilized after World War One. It was World War Two was the first time they did not need, totally demobilize after uh -huh. only after World War Two. I see. Yeah. So we've isn't that a, so such important details here that we had this thing that we think was always around of a standing army. We didn't have that. We had this other way of understanding things. Um, so I'm going to jump ahead now in time. We're getting much closer to current Second Amendment issues. But first, just a little bit of history. There was a big rise in gun laws um, in this country. Um, and part of it had to do with high crime rates in the cities. That was the explanation for why. You know, if I lived in a certain neighborhood and there was lots of guns going off, I might be behind this too. In D.C., Eric Holder promoted Operation Ceasefire, which used, and I had to just put this on bold, pretext traffic stops to arrest people with guns in their cars. Um, and that's something we'll be talking about next month with the Fourth Amendment. Pretext traffic stops means you're looking for a reason to pull somebody over. Eric Holder, who then became Attorney General under Obama. Um, so that was a big shift that started to happen of rising gun laws. Again, good reasons, high crime, uh, but some of the tactics that were used may have been slightly irregular in terms of the Constitution. And the other one is the Violence Against Women Act made it unlawful for anyone with a restraining order to carry a firearm. So these were federal, meaning Congress, passes laws that starts to make it harder um, to 
own a firearm, which raises Second Amendment flags and raises the question, what about the right of the people to keep and bear arms? At this point, remember, the Supreme Court has not said much. In fact, this has been a very sleepy amendment and um, anything the Supreme Court has said has pretty much narrowed the scope of the Second Amendment just to what the federal government does even when the federal government is passing laws like the Violence Against Women Act. And then all of a sudden something changes. It's like, wow, we turn into the second millennium and a new idea appears on the scene, a brand new idea. And maybe it's because it's November 2001. I don't know, that was kind of a, a moment in American history. But we have all of a sudden this memo that comes from John Ashcroft. And it comes because of one of those Violence Against Women Act cases. A doctor in uh, Texas, he had a restraining order against him. And uh, the wife uses the Violence Against Women Act and says, you gotta, he's, he's been abusive to me. He's got a pistol. Take the pistol away. And he takes it. Um, he doesn't go all the way to the Supreme Court. He goes up and the uh, Texas courts uh, say gun ownership is a fundamental right and the federal government says nope, VAWA, Violence Against Women Act, that's what rules. So it's one of those places where there starts the law as being understood in two different ways. So Ashcroft wanders into this and he says, the Second Amendment protects the rights of individuals, including persons who are not members of any militia or engaged in active military service or training to possess and bear their own firearms subject to reasonable restrictions. And it's the first time, really, there should be this moment upon the land where something that was understood as part of the whole Federalist structure, balance of powers, the relationship between the people against a tyrannical authority, it completely gets changed to an individual right. An individual right. So he's not speaking as a Supreme Court justice, he is speaking as John Ashcroft. But he says these words, and there's a lot of people who are very eager to hear it. Yes? Uh, that's his question. What official capacity was he serving when he said that? He, he was AG, he was the Attorney General. Okay. So he, you know, he, can, he can offer his opinion but, on a case. So it's, but it is, at this point, clearly opinion has nothing to do with law. Right, it's a memo, exactly, okay. important, yeah. Um, as the Attorney General, I think he's not so happy that this case, that the United States government is backing uh, Violence Against Women Act and not the um, Texas doctor. So, but that's 2001. And now, yes, Allison. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, I just want to come back to the, the definition of militia that we had earlier from mm -hmm. the Supreme Court, which said all men mm -hmm. who are capable of acting in concert. And in a sense, that's what Ashcroft is also speaking to here. <laughs> but presumably, these persons mm -hmm. who are not actively members of militia or engaged in anything active still could be that. Yes, yeah, and that, thank you, Allison, because here we have, we had, uh, in that Miller decision where the militia was the potential militia and it was all males physically capable of doing this, but it didn't, you didn't have to join a, a militia. So Miller starts to move us in that direction and Ashcroft takes it into, regardless of being male, regardless of being physically capable. You know, you could see it much more like an expansion of, of a Second Amendment right. You could get a gun and you don't have to be physically capable. I may have twisted what you were saying a little bit, but the sense of he opens it up, it's not totally out of line with what came before. Uh, and here we have the big one, District of Columbia versus Heller. The fact that it's a federal case means that we're looking at something that Congress, or a federal, and remember DC is part of the federal system, so um, we're gonna look at something where, a, uh, where Congress passes a rule in a municipality, D.C., and um, they determined that um, whether the gun law was constitutional. Sorry, that was kind of a long thing. 
One little piece I wanted to let people know before I actually tell you what they say in this decision. So do you know how many cases go to the Supreme Court each year? Like, please, would you listen to this, please? It's like seven to 8,000. And they only hear, in Rehnquist's day, it was 75. He was very proud of that. Say, I got it down to 75. That's all we're going to look at. Nowadays, they hear 100 to 150. But massive amounts of cases are trying to get there, and they only pick some. And the reason they pick them is, and, and this isn't cynical at all, the reason they pick them is that the law is too confusing. One city or one state or one interpretation is completely at odds with another. And Heller comes forward and says, um, my gun rights, my Second Amendment rights have been abridged because of DC laws, just like I mentioned with Holder, that restrict the use of handguns. And the court says the Firearms Control Regulations Act is out. So they knock out this DC law, which is federal. The right to bear arms extends beyond military service. Self-defense is a natural right. And that's hard to argue with. Self-defense is a natural right. Um, if you feel that you are at risk in your home and you're like Mr. Heller and you want to have some way to protect yourself in your home, then the court says, and it's a big deal, self-defense is a natural right. They've just taken individual right and they've just made it natural. It's even got more authority. Daniel. Okay. so. Right to bear arms beyond military service? Absolutely, the militia. Mm -hmm. Self-defense, that's, self-defense is a natural right. Isn't that the government's purview to determine what or is not a right and that the court is not designed to legislate? Isn't that clearly legislating? Ah, uh, yes, Daniel, this is what happens with this constitutional democracy. The court, like Roe, the court makes law all the time. They knock out what the democratically elected body created, the Firearms Control Regulations Act. That must have gone through a legislative body and had a clear majority. And yes, the Supreme Court can knock that out just as they have um, many times, actually. But knocking something out is different from establishing something mm -hmm. fundamental. Yep. And uh, if you come to some more of these, which I think you might be because you uh, work here at the library with the technology, we'll see again and again where the Supreme Court, it not only knocks out legislation, it creates arguments for um, the basis of their decision. Um, so I'm gonna push this through a little bit more. I know I'm taking, uh, it's, I'm gonna get to a more open discussion. I w people say, well, with the Heller decision, now there's absolute gun owners' rights. But no, that's not true. Um, Scalia, who wrote this, actually restricted it. Nothing in our opinion should be taken to cast doubt on long-standing prohibitions on the possession of firearms by felons and the mentally ill. That's clearly still the case. You know, and for disability rights activists, they may say, wait a minute, who's going to declare me mentally ill or not? Maybe my ex-wife wants to say I'm mentally ill and she doesn't want me to have a gun. So I, but there, these are the mechanisms in which you can limit gun ownership, gun possession. Uh, or laws forbidding the carrying of firearms in sensitive places, such as schools and government buildings, or I'm guessing Brooks Memorial Library, that when you have something like this, you don't want to have, oh no, it may not, it may not be a, a restricted place. You, and we're a concealed carry place. So this is why one of our reasons, oh, okay, Star, we have the librarian. No, actually, people can carry weapons in here because so, state law supersedes um, ours. So I, somebody, somebody could have a weapon in here tonight, and right. we wouldn't even know. Great. Okay. So this, this. Thank you, Star. So you're absolutely right. Um, so you can have a law that forbids, but if the state does not have such a law, then uh, and as I say, Vermont's concealed carry. And here's another constraint Scalia puts on. Laws imposing conditions and qualifications on the commercial sale of arms. So Scalia has restricted gun buying because you can regulate it as, as you can regulate any object of commerce. 
And here's the dissent. So it was a 5-4 decision, I think. Um, if it were an individual right, the founders would have said so. So Stevens says, wait a minute, whoa, 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 whoa. OK, we had our Second Amendment rights. Everybody understood what that was. And it was understood as militias, whether they were through the states formally or a group of people uh, using the, uh, acting for the consent of the common good. He also says the militia preamble limits the guarantee to state militia service only. So he's really hanging on to that first preamble to make that happen. He also says, hey, I thought we were playing the game starry to ceases. If we look at Miller, or if we look at Cruikshank, those two cases, wouldn't that be enough? That shouldn't, we shouldn't be going on to this new territory. We're doing what people hate. We're being activist judges. And the Supreme Court has never considered gun control laws unconstitutional. Certainly they didn't consider the Miller case, uh, the laws that brought Miller in as, with a shot, sawed off shotgun unconstitutional. But hey, it's a majority game. So Heller, Scalia's decision wins, and that is now the law, which restricts congressional action, pertains to cases that are operating on the larger level. So that's not, that means the states are still, who knows what's going on in the states? Does that make sense? Because we have this such a confusing thing. So here's our next case. This is our final case we're going to look at, um, which happened two years after Heller, McDonald versus the city of Chicago. Here's the plaintiff, Otis McDonald, retired engineer. He'd been living in the same house since 1971. Um, it had been a lovely neighborhood in Chicago, and over time, it, crime had upped. And he was not feeling safe in his home. He was a community organizer. Drug dealers had put a death threat after him. And um, he was feeling very nervous in his home. So Chicago required all guns to be registered with the city. Yeah, any city can do that. And in 1982, this is part of what I was talking about with Eric Holder's, this, these initiatives that started happening, Chicago prohibited the registration of handguns. So you could register a rifle, and, but you could not register a handgun. Otis McDonald had a rifle. He was an experienced hunter. But he did not think a rifle was going to help him, given where he was living. The only thing that was going to help him, he felt, was a handgun. And so he went and um, he made this case to the Supreme Court. You can also see, I think it's fascinating that he's a, uh, when you're looking to bring a case forward, you want your perfect plaintiff. You're always looking. So the people who wanted to um, expand access to reproductive rights to abortion. They were looking for the perfect candidate. And at the time, Norma McCorvey looked perfect. She was Roe and Roe v. Wade. Then lately, uh, after that fact, she became a very strong anti-abortion activist. So she was not the perfect poster child. But Otis McDonald, community organizer, African-American, this is what you call a perfect guy to bring a case forward. So it goes to the Supreme Court, and not surprising given the Heller decision, McDonald succeeds. Here's Alito's opinion. Due process clause of 14th Amendment incorporates the Second Amendment right recognized in Heller. That's a little bit of uh, legal mumbo jumbo, but, but you have to figure out a way to take a Bill of Rights, applies to the federal government, and make it apply to the states. And the way people do that is through a clause in the 14th Amendment. And individual self-defense is the central component of the Second Amendment right. So this is a big shift. He took Scalia's terms and he said, this has always been the case. It is the central component of the Second Amendment. The dissent, um, the framers did not write the Second Amendment in order to protect a private right of armed self-defense. It's very interesting, the privacy piece here. Uh, I, me I keep mentioning Roe because Roe establishes a private right, and, th and now these private rights are being used to Second Amendment concerns. So it, it went from being a political right for a group of people who are arming themselves against tyrants to now a very individualized understanding. 
And, this, and Breyers nails that and says, that's not what the framers wanted. Isn't it interesting how when you like what the framers said, you go, I'm a framer person. But if you don't like what the framers say, they don't serve it. It's like, oh, we don't need that. And usually, Breyer is not understood as a framers kind of guy. Uh, there has been and is no consensus that the right is or was fundamental. So that's, that's the law now for the states as well. Daniel. So the query here is, it seems to me that Breyer is analyzing the Constitution mm -hmm. and, oh, is it Alito? Mm -hmm. Was interpreting it. And is it correct that with interpretation you bring something to the table, with analysis you're supposed to stay with just what is there? That would be nice if, if there were those kind of like hard and fast rules, but they're basically, I mean, I, I'm not cynical about the Supreme Court. I do believe they only take cases where the law is all over the place. So, so they, when the law is all over the place, they need to come up with a solution. Um, do I like uh, Alito's argument, the self-defense piece? Uh, no, but I think he was following, I don't see a difference between what um, Alito was saying in terms of, um, sorry, individual self-defense is a central component and Scalia's is self-defense is a natural right. But it's like Monty Python, they're making it up as they go along. Oh, but they can. <laughs> they can. Well. Yeah, so can we give you the mic? It's been the case. Yeah, yeah, and do you mind telling us just your first name? Gemma. Gemma, thank you. Breyer was completely wrong in his dissent. Mm -hmm. This is really, it's, it's a much more complicated issue than I can really get into. Yeah. Um, there, even going back to Cruikshank, mm -hmm. um, what you left out of what happened in Cruikshank is that the court said the right to keep and bear arms is in no way dependent upon the Constitution for its existence or its validity. Uh -huh. you know, the militia was defined in the Militia Act of 1792. Mm -hmm. these, these things weren't pulled out of a hat. Right. There's a long, long history. And actually, I really recommend that everybody read the DC v. Heller decision, mm -hmm. because Scalia's d opinion mm -hmm. is really one of the best researched and best written opinions in the history of the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. No matter what you think of Scalia otherwise, right. um, he was a very complicated man. Right. Um, and he came down in many decisions on both sides of the aisle, mm -hmm. um, particularly in defense of individual rights. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, so, and everybody hear what Gemma was saying? Like, we could, this is not pulled out of a hat. So Daniel's saying, it feels like it's pulled out of a hat. That's exactly Gemma's wonderful. saying, say, no, this was always understood. In fact, if we think of it as a fundamental right or as a natural right, it's pre-constitutional. And I would yeah. like to add to that, that the word, Funda the term fundamental right has mm -hmm. a very specific definition in U.S. jurisprudence. Mm -hmm. I, I don't remember the name of the case where it was defined. Um, it, uh, there's been a number of them and it usually has to do with is central, uh, they have about six different definitions yeah. depending on what case, but one of them is, is essential to the American scheme of justice. Yeah. Fundamental to the conception of ordered liberty. Fundamental and, to the ordered conception and, and of liberty. And long-standing yeah. um, practice within American society. Yes. Exactly. This is yeah. exactly the type of stuff that doesn't filter through to people like me, that I don't understand where the, yeah. where the ground is. Right, right. And so it looks like, if all I do is look at the Constitution, mm -hmm. it looks like it's out of a hat. Right. But in fact, right. yeah, there's, there's, and yeah, thank you, Daniel, for like I, recognizing. Yeah, I, I wanted to add one other thing because you brought up the question of interpretation versus analysis. Mm -hmm. And the way the courts look at it is interpretation versus construction. Interpretation is to say, what does the Constitution mean? Mm -hmm. And construction is, what does that meaning require of us that the Constitution does not say? Nice, and a, nice comparison, right, thank you. Yeah, analysis, sorry, interpretation versus construction. Yeah, you had your hand up right here on the aisle, and then we'll... I would recommend that, that Daniel read um, The Most Dangerous Branch. It's a relatively new book, mm -hmm. and it, um, it, it traces the, the, it's the Supreme Court they're talking about, and it traces the Supreme Court from its beginning, but into the 70s or 80s where it started making laws mm -hmm. instead of interpreting mm -hmm. laws. Um, because of the do-nothing Congresses. 
Mm. Mm -hmm. So if, if you read that book, you will understand it better. The Supreme Court, that's why we have so much, so much fighting when we get a new, you know, when there's a new justice coming up. Should we do a conservative justice, a liberal justice, and so on? Um, because of the living constitution, or is it the original, mm -hmm. originalists, and, and so on, this type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the people say, well, you know, the one, one big thing is the Roe versus Wade. We don't want that overturned, we don't want that overturned. And so the Democrats or, or the liberals in, in Congress keep saying, when these justices come before the hearings in Congress, they keep, um, saying, are you going to overturn, are you going to overturn, are you going to overturn? Well, if we didn't overturn, we would still have the Dred Scott decision. <laughs> we would still have Plessy versus Ferguson, where separate, but equal. you know, uh, separate is, um, um, uh, where, where we can have separate schools for, and separate for food counters and so on for these people. So we would still have a lot of, our laws, the Supreme Court decisions that should have been overturned and were overturned. <laughs> and, and, and can you remind us your name? I'm Betty. Betty. So, I, I mean, what I... What, but, but if you read that book, mm -hmm, The, the most, most Dangerous Branch, I've forgotten the author. It's, it's quite a... It's, it's written within the last few years. Right. But it traces... It and in fact, there it is. And here's our librarian holding it. Excellent. Yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah. So, so, what you know, what Betty and, and to respond to Daniel Singh, and we also had Robert over there. Um, if we could just get the mic to Robert. Oh, no, 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 I didn't have a you didn't have a question. Okay. Um, but, but this idea that the Supreme Court does in interpreting and constructing, in order to resolve all these different problems that people have, they make decisions. And it creates new what seems like new laws. And it and see and they are new laws. And, and Laws. Um, so sometimes it's not a matter of public opinion. Sometimes it's a matter of new discoveries in science right. or new discoveries in economics, uh, uh, something like this. Where, oh yeah, that should be overturned, you know, because now we have some new in interpretation of this. Sometimes it's just opinion. Yeah, and that's what we have to live with. Again, and, this is a, one of those things where we may like a decision or not like a decision, but that's what the decision is. What do they say? The Supreme Court is not fallible. Oh, I'm going to get it wrong. It's, 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 it's fallible. It's infallible because it's final. Right. And it's, and it's its finality that, that that's just the law that we live with. And it means that, you know, Gemma is going to hear um, Scalia and Alito's opinions and feel that absolutely right, that's, that's totally right. Somebody else may read them and say, that's so wrong. And yet that's this game that we play. And these five, four decisions are laws of one person. Yeah. The fifth person. Well, the, these yeah. five, four decisions, right. And there aren't that many of them. They oftentimes get the most right. attention. Right. So I want to just turn to some open questions. But first, Jinsi wanted to say one thing. And then, I'm uh, oh, sorry, Daniel, Jinsi's right here. I just, thank you. I, I'm listening to some people who are far better educated than I. And uh, what I'm thinking is that there's a difference between owning a gun and using it. Mm -hmm. And that's what has to be decided, that it's fine to own a gun, but it's the problem of who you can use it and what conditions that, that makes things very, very complicated. Uh-huh, so, so, and this is where we're gonna to start to get more into the details here. The Second Amendment says, you get to own it, you get to possess it. And then there are rules though, there are laws that you can't do certain things, right? You I mean, you, whether you have a gun or not, you, if you have a loaded cudgel, which is not a gun, right. you can do a lot of damage with that and there's gonna be a law against that. Um, so I wanna just open this up to some more questions. I've got a couple um, because yes, the whole idea of individual rights is fundamental, even though, and, and, I'll, and I'll, Gem and I can maybe do a debate on this at some point, it only became part of constitutional reasoning fairly late. And, and so there's a whole other line of jurisprudence that says, no, that was a collective right. That was the rights of the people, just like we the people. And when people are talking about the Second Amendment, they are talking about the right to armed rebellion, 
which is different than individual self-defense. So there's, that's one of the um, tensions that we have right now. Um, and the uh, right to self-defense was something that was clearly within the states, thinking that the states would need to take down the federal government. So if you have the Second Amendment was intended to give more power to the states, now it's understood as an individual right, what does that say about our experience of federalism? And it's probably one of the things that I'm most sad about as we move more and more into individual rights and, and people get more and more disgruntled with the Electoral College is that federalism it, as a concept is losing its legitimacy. Gemma, you have something to say. Yes, I just wanted to add to that that the Second Amendment was intended to give more power to the states in that the states are virtually unrestricted right. in what they can regulate in terms of firearms. Mm -hmm. um, in here in Vermont, we're one of the few states who which has very few restrictions right. on firearms. Yeah. But um, New Jersey's laws, mm -hmm. which are very strict uh, gun control, they've been challenged in court before and they've been upheld right. uh, because it's New Jersey's um, right. authority yeah. to regulate how guns are used in New Jersey. Yeah, so in that sense, people are getting a federalist boost by determining where to live based on what the gun laws are. Mm -hmm. And that may be true, depending on what happens with Roe, as people make decisions about reproductive rights. And that could be good for a federalist project. And this has been actually very evident in the uh, Supreme Court jurisprudence post-McDonald. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court has pretty much almost entirely refused to take any further Second Amendment questions. Mm -hmm. and, and they are even allowing circuit splits to stand, uh -huh. which is extremely unusual. And, and Gemma, so that everybody understands, are you suggesting then that the state, uh, sorry, that the Supreme Court is happy with a patchwork of gun laws within each of all the different states? That seems to be the case. Yes. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Robert. Yeah, just one question. But doesn't the federal government, don't they have a monopoly on force? On force. On force, on the use of force. And they can override states' rights if they need, if they feel it's necessary? Well, I mean, I, you know, I don't want to be talking about states arming themselves against the feds, but I think those conversations sometimes have happened or might happen in the future. And, and in terms of constitutional authority, uh, you know, I think um, that's where armed rebellion is going to happen. And, and there's nothing in the Constitution. The Constitution says it's that Article 4, Section 4, um, that the, sta the states have to have a Republican form of government. So if a state starts to behave like a tyranny, then the federal government could say they are legitimately able to use a lot of force. But if the state is saying, no, we are a free state, and you are the ones who are causing all the problems, um, there's nothing in the Constitution, I don't think, that uh, allows for the, uh, the government to slap down the states. In fact, it's all designed so the states can to take on the feds. But that, that, and, that, that's a cool design for any court. Yeah. And, and then Betty wants us to always know that if this goes up to the Supreme Court, who depends on who's there. But Kim, Kim, yeah. I want to take a step back why I came here tonight. <clears throat> Maybe someone can help me. There are 55,000 gun deaths a year. Is that in the right ballpark? It's pretty high. It's up there yeah, around... It's a Vietnam War worth of deaths per year. Yeah. A percentage of those are suicides, but mm -hmm. most of it are gun deaths in urban areas largely. And secondly, I'm from Cleveland, so we have a group called Black on Black Crime that I'm involved with. And they go out to the vigils of the young teenagers that shoot each other in gang violence on the streets. And there's a wall of sour sorrows that has a thousand names on it. Mm. So I come with that background. Mm. And so that's why this is important, this conversation mm -hmm. about how we're gonna live in this country in different places. And rural is different than urban and all that stuff. But what I really want to change the subject if anyone's familiar with a book called Loaded by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, mm. and she spoke in Cleveland, whoever's up there, can see if they have it. Yeah. She's fantastic. She's taken her book, her original book was The Indigenous People's History mm -hmm. of the United States, where she makes a nod to Howard Zinn. Uh -huh. And some people said this is a fantastic book, but her more recent book is Loaded the history of the Second Amendment is cultural rather than legal. Mm -hmm. To me, it's important. I'll just say it real short, and if anybody else knows about it, it is that she attributes the militias to two things in history. And I don't know if this timing fits with your timeline, but she attributes it to two things. First, it was to kill the Indians 
on the frontier to take their land and militias were formed when the U.S. military, 4th Cavalry, and that had to be later, was not available, but that's her cultural history yeah. of one reason for militias, and that was really active because militias were more prevalent than the U.S. military, the 4th Cavalry, whatever. Mm -hmm. The second was the militias formed to do the slave catching mm -hmm. as people ran away north, and the Underground Railroad early went west to the Indian tribes where the black people could escape and be taken in. Mm -hmm. And that other, the militias were necessary after Nat Turner when they thought about putting down right. slave rebellions. So right. if we see militias in the context of black history and Native American history, it makes us understand why we're such a vulnerable country yeah. and we're living the violence of the post-reconstruction civil war mm -hmm. and certainly the Native Americans were extinguished for the most part so this is a way to understand how we're living today if anybody right. has opinions on that I'd like to hear it. thank yeah. you thank you thank you for uh, telling us about that book and and what she the... spoke and she was tremendous yeah. you might loaded loaded it's worth looking up or even just read a short synopsis of it right and get her drift one of the, the pieces that, to bring in the uh, Reconstruction, so much despair and anger that Second Amendment rights were not granted to free black men. And, and Alito actually cites that in his decision, that, this is, that the McDonald case is trying to remedy a pass where um, African Americans are pretty much sitting targets after Reconstruction because nobody's going to let them have firearms. It's you know, one of those other sides. Yes. I, I'm confused about this, um, f the idea that the federal um, government is basically giving the states the right to make the laws that they want. Uh, a and then in Chicago, it sounds like at least the city and maybe the state wanted to actually do this, and then they were not allowed to do that by the federal government. So how do those... The Supreme Court said they couldn't have a blanket ban uh, on uh, handguns in Chicago. It wasn't that they were necessarily preempting all state law, but there's a certain category of laws, mainly when it comes to blanket bans, as uh, is discussed in Heller and in McDonald, that are disallowed. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I had one other question. What constrains tyranny in the 21st century if it's not guns? Because, again, this is sort of going back to our history. Is there some other way to constrain tyranny? Voting rights. Voting rights? <laughs> yep, you could say that. Right? The free Maybe. press. Free press, right? Nobody reads the papers. Ah, Betty says nobody reads the papers. So, I mean, yes, Marcelin. Come back to Marcelin. Um, and, and my last question, and I also am interested in any of yours, is can there ever be a people given the racial disparities in American history? That's a, and that's a somber note. It's going on what Kim is talking about in this book, Loaded. Uh, we have this game that we play. It's from we the people, and we the people have this collective right um, that gives us this right to armed rebellion. But is it also then we, we get this collective right to firearms and one faction the dominant faction just decides to take out a group that it finds problematic. That certainly is what happened in Louisiana, but in other places as well. So, um, so you know, it's one of those problems we're suffering. Kim? The Black Panthers marched arms into the California legislature with their guns at one point mm -hmm. at a strategic moment when they were having clashes so that California was, but they actually went armed onto the floor of the legislature to make their point right. on that. Right, and, and uh, I, I certainly, like growing up, and I mentioned this to the Osher crowd when we looked at guns, for me a, a defining moment is when the Black Panthers came to New Haven and all of a sudden a lot of people that I knew were being much more cautious about what they were saying. And, and they weren't shooting their guns. There was also tanks there. The National Guard was very present. So we had the National Guard there to maintain order. And we had the helicopters going around. And then there was the, the Black Panthers, who were very nicely dressed. I was so impressed by them, who were standing there fully armed. And uh, people behaved. It's, you know, I don't want to minimize. Was it Robert was talking about 55,000 people or gun deaths? Or somebody was just mentioning that, Kim? Right? I, I don't want to minimize how dangerous this is, but it's, it's, it is part of our political tapestry. 
Yes, uh, Kit. Yes, thank you. Uh, in the instances of Black Panthers going into public places, <coughs> et cetera, with guns and other situations like that, mm -hmm. were the guns loaded? They looked kind of loaded. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I, I didn't ask them. I put flowers in the rifle butts of the National Guard, but the planters, I'm just like, whoa. They had a standoff with the police, and a policeman who had his gun out backed down because they were pretty sure that if they didn't back down, they were going to face gunfire. You have to read I, this vague to me, but the Panthers were on the steps of the legislature, or at least somewhere like that, and there was a very tough cop who had his gun, and he had to make a decision whether he was going to use it or not, and he backed down, right. and people were surprised. Right. Okay. Because he was a tough guy. Yeah. So that might have been a defining moment. And I hope I have my history correct. No, I, that's what I had heard as well. I don't, you remember this? These, the Panthers in New Haven? I'm putting my sister on the spot. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Big impression. Big impression. <laughs> um, Neely is thinking it was the steps of the courthouse. Yeah. Uh, Woody. People responded, oh, sorry, yeah. thanks. People responded, uh, we can vote or mm -hmm. we can have a free press and so mm -hmm. on. Um, I, my personal feeling is that we, we're in big trouble here in this country and around the world and that uh, it's going to take a fundamental sort of reorientation for all of us mm -hmm. towards uh, away from a culture of violence that we're living in and towards... Um, a personal change for each of us that is oriented towards helping other people as a goal in life instead of competing, mm -hmm. for example. And I personally think that's what it's going to take for us. I don't think we have a lot of other recourse mm -hmm. except to get together, to work together, mm -hmm. and to help each other. Right, right. Thank you. But thank you so much yeah. for this presentation. Yeah. And, and, and Woody, I think, you know, this is where we want us to be a better country, right? We want us to be we the people. Absolutely. I think the reason the Constitution starts we the people is that's what we desperately want. And the way to get that is, is the way you were talking about it. And then we have these other human uh, concerns fears, anxiety, and a great amount of fear of tyranny and standing armies so deeply embedded. So we're just about running out of time. Are there any last questions, comments, or, or whatever? Yes, Neely? Yes, um, but Oliver's sister, Maddie, right? Yes. Oh, do you guys want to sing? That would be a lovely way to end. Well, we certainly could. Should we have a vote? <laughs> Should we have a vote? Would you like to end with vote with some singing? Yes. So, yes, we have one. We'll get Lynn Martin's question, and then let us. I think that's a I beautiful idea. I didn't have a idea. question. I a just comment. wanted to reiterate what Woody said. It's we, the people. It's not they. Right. Exactly, thank you. Yeah, my whole desire to do this series is to say, we want this we the people, and we may have different interpretations, and we may be analyzing, or constructing, or interpreting, but I think in our hearts we really want this we the people. It's just we're going to have to make sense of all these amendments, and this is maybe a really tough one for some, and then my guess is the ninth is also going to be a tough one for some, and that that's kind of how this game is. Um, James Madison said that uh, he wanted this whole thing to work with a strong centralized government. He didn't get what he wanted. He ended up with this crazy federalism. And then he began to realize, this is fabulous, because we're always going to be arguing. Things will always be ambiguous. And maybe that's better. So let's end with some beautiful singing. <laughs> OK, we'll, everybody up. Uh, we're going to sing it. Sing the second and third amendments again because that's all we have. Great. <laughs> all to no. all well regulated militia.
the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep them their hearts. The right of the people to keep them their hearts. The right of the people to keep them their hearts. The right of the right of the